This afternoon's session is an introduction to .NET Core on Linux and Docker. It's given by Todd Thompson. And I'm going to hand the time over to Todd. Oh, will you need anybody to run around with this during the session? No, no, that's fine. All right, thank you so much for coming along to my workshop, uh, an introduction to .NET Core on Linux and Docker. Um, today is a hands-on workshop, so if you don't have a laptop, then please buddy up with someone who does, so you can follow along. Um, it also, .NET Core is not supported on every distribution of Linux. Um, there is a pretty big list of distributions, but it's not every distro. Um, so I do have some pre-baked virtual machines that are Ubuntu 16.10 x64, uh, and, and I've also got copies of uh, the virtualization software for Windows and for Mac OS. Obviously, if you need it for Linux, you could um, install it with your package manager and then import the OVA as well. So anyone I haven't come around and seen, I will come around and see you very shortly. All right, cheers. So welcome, my name's Todd. I'm a senior consultant at this company called Redify, which um, most of you probably have not heard of. Um, I'm yeah, senior consultant. I've been writing programming computers since 1986. Um, I started programming on a Commodore 64, programming BASIC. Um, I'm now mostly writing .NET Core um, on Linux, Mac, and on Windows, um, and doing lots of Node.js development, that kind of stuff. Um, my Twitter handle is Todd Thompson. Please feel free to tweet if you're a tweeter. Um, my blog is at toddthompson.com. Uh, there's a few articles there that might be of interest to you. Um, Redify is uh, basically a business of consulting software developers. We mostly work on Microsoft. I'm trying to change that. I'm trying to make us into a Linux business. So it's a, it's a hard slog, but it's, um, it's interesting. Um, they say Redify's technically brilliant people work with clients to deliver outstanding software with velocity and uncommon sense. Um, my version of that is that we're 225 software developers and 17 admin staff. So it's a pretty, pretty cool business to work for. Um, we were the Microsoft Partner of the Year in Australia 2015 and the ALM Partner of the Year 2015. Um, we do have a careers website if you're looking for a career in mostly Microsoft stuff. I suspect m nobody in this room will be looking for that. I am. Talk to me after? <laughs> All right. Um, so social media, please, please get on social media and go on about that because my employer loves to hear things on social media and they tend to send me places and let me do cool stuff like talk about uh, .NET Core on Linux, so please do that. Please add me on LinkedIn if you're a LinkedIn person. Um, I always like to keep, keep um, up with people that I've met at conferences. Today's agenda. So today we're going to be looking at the hello world in .NET Core. So we're going to be installing the .NET Core toolchain and building the basic hello world. We then go on to look at um, the .NET Core CLI, um, and we also go on to look at unit testing in .NET Core. After that, we'll be looking at ASP.NET Core which is the uh, web technology that is built on top of .NET Core. We'll also be looking at some integration testing work in that area. Um, after that, we'll look at Hello World on Docker, um, and we'll look at Hello World on .NET Core on Docker. Um, if you get time, there's also a bunch of Node.js, Yeoman, scaffolding, funky stuff at the end, which you may or may not get time for. Normally, I run this as a whole day workshop, um, and as you can see, I've cut the first two chapters out because everyone here knows about Linux installation, configuration, and maintenance, I'm sure. Uh, normally, I talk to people, a bit, I'm mainly doing this to sell Linux to .NET developers who've never actually done any Linux before. So I've kind of flipped the whole thing on the head today. Um, so I'm just ignoring the Linux stuff and just kicking straight into the .NET Core stuff. After that, if you do finish everything, you can always start hacking around on .NET Core, building some stuff. Um, I can help out with that kind of thing as well. So we'll keep going as quickly as we can. All right, so, so why am I here today? Um, so, there's a famous quote that's quite often um, attributed to Einstein, which it seems that perfection is attained not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing more to take away. Um, .NET Core is a ground-up rewrite of the .NET ecosystem, so they've basically rewritten everything from scratch. Um, all of the development's been done in public on GitHub, and it's licensed under an OSI-approved license. So this is a very, very different Microsoft than we saw uh, you know, six, four or five or six years ago. So it's, um, it's a pretty exciting time for me to be a .NET developer, having been a Linux um, enthusiast since 1999. It's nice to see sort of two halves of my world converge. 
Um, and that's the main reason I'm doing this stuff, is I want people to start writing these things on Linux rather than writing them on Windows. Um, I've got some VirtualBox pre-baked VMs for anyone who doesn't have one of the supported distros, so please let me know after the intro and I'll... What's the, uh, the password is LCA2017, for anyone who's got the VM already. So VirtualBox is just really easy. You've got Windows, you've got Mac, you've got Linux, you've got any other VirtualBox distro, you can import my VM. That's really the only reason I picked VirtualBox. Um, Ubuntu Linux is the default uh, distribution that the developers at Microsoft are using to build all this stuff. They're also, um, there's someone from Red Hat in the room, they're also um, partnered with the guys at Red Hat and they're doing amazing work there, um, making it a first class citizen on, on all of the Red Hat distros, so that's amazing. At the time it was just, when it was released, it was just Ubuntu and nothing else, so that's why I've, I've chosen Ubuntu. Um, so .NET Core and ASP.NET Core, I'm a .NET Core developer and I, I enjoy working in this tool chain and I love the fact that it's open source and I love the fact that it's cross-platform. So um, I'm here to sort of share that with you today. Um, Node.js and Yeoman are really great. I don't know if anyone, is anyone here a Node.js guy, done Yeoman before? Two, three people? Um, Node's pretty well, well known. Yeoman is a scaffolding tool, so it basically lets you generate um, huge amounts of boilerplate code and the, the .NET Core guys and the ASP.NET Core guys have actually built uh, a generator for that and the generator is extremely detailed and it covers 15 or 20 different types of projects and lots of different types of you know, controllers and actions and views and all the kind of things that you have in a, a web application. So that gives you a, a sort of a kickstart or a head start to actually um, building these applications rather than having to learn where the bits and pieces go. You can just scaffold out a new thing and then sort of start filling in the blanks. So that's what makes this, you know, Yeoman and Node.js interesting in this particular Sorry, case. Uh, is it scaffolding also for .NET Core or just Node.js? No, it's scaffolding for .NET Core, oh. yeah. So it's kind of a weird sort of juxtaposition. Rather than writing their own, own scaffolding tool, they basically just jumped on board with the Yeoman stuff. And, uh, you know, and, and just, you know, Yeoman's great at just generating any type of code, right? It doesn't need to be, be JavaScript code. All right, I apologize for going so quickly, but I know we've got very limited time. Is there any quick questions before we get started? Go for it. I've only got 64. Have you got a 32-bit um, guest operating, a host operating system? It can be changed. It can be changed? Yeah. Yeah, that's probably, probably the best way to do it. Yeah, I'll come and see you in a sec. Anyone else got any quick questions before we get started? All right, so let me just show you. Um, we're skipping the Linux chapters and heading straight in. If you go to my GitHub, which you can see there is, um, can everyone read that there or is that too small? Maybe I meant to make that a bit bigger. It's not gonna make it any bigger like that, is it? All right. that better? <laughs> Terrible. You never thought you'd see Notepad at LinuxConf, did you? Um, so if you basically go to um, github.com slash Todd Thompson slash, and you just go there and click on the first link, of course, but you can also type intro to linux.net core docker, and we're looking for part three. So um, I'll show you that very quickly. So you see there, if you just go to the, go to the homepage there, You'll see the homepage, and then if you scroll down here, if you scroll down, you'll see a look a lovely photo of the CEO with Microsoft Love Linux in the background. Um, and then if you continue down here, there's a bit of an introduction. What you want to basically do is come down to here and go to section three, which is the .NET Core section. Um, and once you get there, you can click on part three, and that'll load into the the correct section. And then you'll see a list of supported distributions here. So if you don't have one of these Linux distros listed here, and this version, and this architecture, then I do have a VM on a USB stick. And that's it. Let's get started. All right, I'll come around and, well, I'll help people get started. Is there anyone that doesn't have, anyone that doesn't have one of these distros here that I haven't spoke to already? yourself. Anyone else? Two? And this is a very much an interactive session, so feel free to talk. I'm not going to stand up here 
all afternoon and just talk about stuff. So if you if you upgrade the 64 bit, well I'm you, doing that, but that's not quite okay. So what's that there? That's, so that's a uh, pre-baked Ubuntu VM, right? 1610 x64. Well, could I just download this from GitHub and interact a bit and use it that way? You, you could. Um, which which district are you running here? Slackware. Slackware. Oh, okay. This is going to be tricky. Can you run um, VirtualBox on Slackware or? Yeah, yeah. I haven't installed it. I've installed it back yeah. in. Yeah. And I can, I can switch. It. What I've got is 64-bit Linux running 32-bit executables right now. Okay. And right. I can. I have to. Um, I would imagine for a 64-bit. Um, Thing or I'll have to run the 64-bit compiler. Yeah, you will. You, you need to, you need a 64-bit host operating system well, to be able to. The yeah. system is, but the, to build a 64-bit virtual box, you'll have to switch compilers. Right. To do that. That's right. not right. It yeah. might take me half an hour or something. Yeah, it's it's. You're welcome to, to have a go. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll, okay. And then. Uh,
Hey. Uh, that's right. I'm just sure. trying to build it online and that's not working because of apps and mm -hmm. stuff. Right. What, which version uh, have you got there? 16... It's not the implementation of PowerShell sort of on Linux that I dislike about PowerShell. It's PowerShell, PowerShell itself. itself. Okay. Yeah. So um, I, I don't think objects as a way to um, link together different things is appropriate. I think just dealing with plain text is much simpler because you, you constantly have to think about what kind of object a thing is, but the objects are all opaque in PowerShell. So it's, it's not an enjoyable. Has everyone found the GitHub site and found part three and has sort of gotten started? Is there, is there anyone who hasn't gotten started yet? Okay, one, two. All right, I'll come and see that you guys.
So the pre-baked image is just Linux. There's no .NET Core on the pre-baked image at all. You, that, the whole point of that image is to give you a clean slate so you don't have to infect your existing Linux distro with the .NET Core stuff, because after this workshop, you may never want that stuff on your system again. So by using the VM, you can just do it in a VM, put the stuff on, play around with it, you know, willy-nilly, and then just keep, keep or not keep the VM as your heart desires. I think there's 10 or 15. Is, is anyone having trouble getting networking working with the image that I've given you? If you are, let us know. Because obviously you'll need network access so you can access uh, apt-get and install the things. Without that, the kind of workshop, you won't get very far, basically. Yeah. So, so if any of you are stuck with no internet on your on the VM I provided, just please let me know.
So when you first encounter the .NET test command when you're exploring the CLI, it's just an exploration of the different parts of the CLI. As you go further down in the workshop, you'll notice there's a section on testing, and that section explains how to write the unit test and configure the project.json to link the test framework with the test runner so the CLI can run the tests. Um, so the first time you run .NET test, if you get an error saying there's no tests, that's because obviously we haven't written the test yet. So.
one. So, so I guess I'll give a really quick history of .NET for anyone who's interested. Um, so, so .NET was created in like 1998, um, released in beta in 99, and released for real in about the end of 2000. Um, this is a completely new thing. So this is a new compiler, a new runtime, new virtual machine, new libraries written from scratch. Um, so this is like, even though it's got the same name being .NET, you know, .NET Core, it's not the same code, it's not the same platform. Um, what they tried to do is draw a line in the sand and re-implement everything from scratch, um, ignoring all of the mistakes that have been made in the past. Um, so even though the current version of the old .NET is, I think, 4.6.2, um, and this is a, even though this is ASP.NET Core 1.1, it's actually more like version 5 of the old stuff. So it's like a whole new generational jump again on the old stuff. So when you're writing old .NET apps, so if you've got .NET, .NET, .NET apps back at your business that are, sound 4.5 or 4.6 or whatever, you need to port those to .NET Core, um, and depending on what... API, like what um, libraries you're using there, it may or may not be a straightforward process. So um, the really obvious one, there's a thing called system.web, um, and system.web.dll was the original ASP.NET implementation that came out in 2001, and it's this giant monolithic thing that's full of like view state and caching and all these other things that are done in a very poor performing way. So they basically got rid of that completely, and in, in .NET Core, there's a whole new set of web libraries for doing web development. Um, so when you port from an old Web Forms app or an old MVC app or an old Web API, you have to kind of re-jig a fair bit of stuff. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a very, that's a pretty fair analogy. Um, so you know, the Python three, Python two thing was a big deal. Um, this is kind of yeah, it's a big, pretty big breaking change. Um, so if you've got existing apps, you would need to port them probably forward to 4.6.2. And once you've done that and it's all working, then you'd have to port them from 4.6.2 of original .NET to .NET Core 1.1. Some of our web developers have been 4.1 versus 4.6 and it's been Yeah, yeah, that, that's 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 exactly right. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of third-party libraries that were written for the old version of .NET that, when this stuff first came out, they didn't. Those third-party libraries didn't run on .NET Core, and because of the way that it was implemented, it took quite a bit of time for these guys to actually re-implement their own um, libraries and make them run on top of .NET Core. An example that was given there was log for net which was a, is a very common um, logging framework, anyone's a Java developer in the room, it's, it was basically a source port like 10, 10, 12 years ago of Log4J. If anyone's used Log4J, that's a pretty well-known Java, Java uh, logging framework. So, um, so, so yeah, the, the key thing is if you're starting a new app, that's a really great time to do some .NET Core because that means that you're sort of future-proofing your app for the next 15 years. Um, if you've got an existing app, it just depends on what the investment might be to port it. Um, so you might try to port it and it's easy, cool, you port it, no worries. And if you try to port it and you find out it's a huge job, um, you're probably better off just keeping it on Windows. Um, it may be not worth the investment to port it to this stuff, which is unfortunate because obviously if you do port it to .NET Core, you can start running it on Linux in production. You can start doing development on Linux desktops or even Mac OS or whatever you like. So, um, so porting it's good, but it may not be cost effective to port it basically. Yeah. Did you want me to, if we're going to do questions, do you want me to take the mic around or did you, I don't know. I, I assume there's probably no one on the internet watching anyway, so <laughs> it probably doesn't matter. Yeah, they probably all went to another stream. Did you say log for net is not working or log for net still not working? Um, log, log for net wasn't working last time I looked. 
um, but it may, may be working now. You, you could always just, just Google log for net .NET core support and you'll find the answer pretty, pretty quickly. Um, th there's a great logging framework that um, a friend of mine wrote called Serilog. Um, it's a structured logging framework for .NET. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the concept of structured logging, um, but, but that's what I would recommend if you're doing an ASP.NET Core app is just to, or a .NET Core app is just have a look at Serilog. Um, it basically serializes the format strings and the data as separate entities, and then you, you can then recombine them at runtime to regenerate the log entries. And so that way, if, you're, if you need to then parse your logs in the future, um, to do some sort of data analysis, you've got your log message and you've got your data structure persisted as a separate thing. Um, log for net is very much um, a bad logging implementation, basically. So, so I'm, not, I'm, not a huge, I'm not a huge fan of it, yeah. You like it? All right, if you like it, then that's cool. Um, I'm just, yeah, I, I'd say check out Serilog if you can. Do you want... I think the mic's still off. Is my mic on or off? Mine's on? Yeah, cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a developer, but I've Hang got on, a, sorry. a question that one of my developers is thinking about. Um, and that's, is the .NET Mono um, environment run on Linux uh, completely separate to .NET Core. Yeah. And so Mono is like um, getting framework 4. Point whatever to run on Linux, whereas yeah. this is a rewrite from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. I'm 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 certainly not a a, a Mono expert. Um. So I, if I say something wrong, and the internet can tell me, that's great. Or you guys. But um. My understanding is yeah. Mono, mono is a re-implementation of a compatible framework for running old .NET apps, and .NET Core is a, is a, a line in the sand new version. So yeah, so um, I think Mono will continue as that, but as far as new .NET Core stuff, that'll be driven from Microsoft cross-platform. And the other part of the um, question is, are there performance differences between Mono and Linux versus .NET Core and Linux? Yeah, um, I, I, don't, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I would suggest that from the other performance numbers I've seen, um, .NET Core is, in a lot of situations, a number of orders of magnitude faster than .NET on Windows. So it's a huge performance increase. Um, and Mono has been known to be worse performing than .NET on Windows. So therefore, .NET Core, if you understand the kind of argument that I'm making, yeah, it's, um, it, it would be a huge performance increase over Mono. Okay. Um, yeah. I know, I know they had terrible problems, for example, in Mono with um, the, the view renderer uh, for, for compiling views, um, and that's 200 times faster in .NET Core than it was in .NET, because um, they've got a new compiler that does in-memory compilation, and the old version of the compiler was a, a, a file-based compiler, um, so the in-memory compiler is obviously, uh, compiling to memory is obviously a lot faster. So, um, yeah, go for it, man. Hi, Todd. Hi. Um I watched that um, AWS event last month. Uh, they were saying they're announcing Lambda to support .NET Core. Like, uh, I don't really know, like, have you used it before? And if you have, like, how does it behave? Like, is it actually really, really good? Yeah, um, I mean, that's an excellent question. I, I haven't used, I've used AWS Lambda. Um, I've written all of my Lambdas in JavaScript. Um, but they, yet yeah, they have ha added .NET support. So the idea of that is that you would have fragments of, of uh, C sharp code uh, written in basically against the .NET Core APIs, and they will execute in a, in a kind of managed environment in AWS the same way that you do at the moment with Java or JavaScript or anything like that. I don't know if you've done you're familiar with Lambda. Yeah, yeah. Um, we were using Golang, but we wrapped yeah. it in the Python, so that it compiles in the Lambda. It's a bit weird, but you know. Anyway. Yeah, my, you're, yeah, indeed. Like most of the, I mean, I don't know if anyone's familiar with um, with uh, AWS Lambdas. And there's a thing on Azure called Azure Functions. It's the same thing. It's basically a an environment for serverless deployment of code. So you don't deploy any, have any concept of servers. You just have a bunch of code that 
you get a bunch of events that happen and you execute some code based on those events and you kind of get this ripple effect as it ripples out and more events get raised and more code gets executed. Um, and there's a project called Serverless that is, is putting a whole development framework over the top of AWS Lambda that kind of handles how this code gets through, you know, dev and test and into production and how it gets version controlled and all of the standard quality practices in software development. Um, I'm, I'm not, I, I certainly have, I've never done any, anything with C Sharp. It's just, um, just JavaScript, yeah. Just no, basically Node.js, yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're right. They are. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, that makes me nervous. <laughs> does it, does anyone else have any questions or? So All right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the I, job works well. Um, so. It's one of those things where it, it tends to be depend on how the application is written. So if the application is written in a very, using all of the old APIs from system.web, um, it means you kind of have to rewrite a fair whack of your application. Um, most of what we've been doing over the last um, sort of 10 or 15 years in, in kind of, you know, non-trivial .NET development has kind of moved us away from using system.web. Um, and stopped, we've stopped doing web forms because that was a total nightmare. Um, we've stopped using a lot of the, you know, the page caching stuff and all the other things that were kind of making our applications run poorly. So if you've got a kind of up-to-date application written in an up-to-date style of development, uh, it shouldn't be too hard to port it over. Um, if you've got an old web forms app that you sort of kept carrying along and carrying along for years and years and years and it's still got all of those old things in it, um, you'd have to replace each one of those pieces with something else um, to, that, that could achieve the same outcome, yeah. So it, it just depends. I guess it's the classic consulting answer. It just depends, right? Yeah. All right. Any other questions? All right, I'm, I might just quickly sum up because I know I've got about two minutes left. Is that, is that right? Yep, cool. All right. So today we've looked at Hello World in .NET Core, um, Hello World in ASP.NET Core, uh, Hello World in Docker. I don't know, how many people got to Docker today? Um, half the room, yeah, okay. Um, the Docker stuff's pretty interesting. Um, I've got a bunch of slides on Docker. I'll, I'll make the slides available on the GitHub site and I'll make it really clear. Um, basically, we go through Docker and explain a bunch of things, but it's all, it's all there in the tutorial. Um, so I'll skip that because we don't have time. Um, and there's obviously Node.js and Yeoman. I don't know if anyone got that far, but that's probably the most interesting bit for me because um, it does all the scaffolding of all your, all your bits and pieces. Um, choose your own adventure, probably we've run out of time for that. Um, recap, I think I've probably recapped okay. Um, I just want to say thanks to LinuxConf for having me. Um, it's, a, it's a great honour to be here. I've been going to LinuxConf for seven years uh, and uh, first time speaking, so that's awesome. Thanks to you guys for coming along. Um, I was really happy with the turnout, so I hope you've, hope you've learned something. Um, it was very enjoyable. Um, if you've got anything interesting, please post PRs, or please, if you've got any issues with the tutorial or you need any assistance, please post all of that to GitHub, and I'm more than happy to help you guys out um, as, you know, over the next weeks or months or whatever. Um, if you've got any feedback, please tweet or email me at take a photo. If you've got feedback, please. I really love feedback. And here's my promise. If you give me feedback, I will buy you a beer or soft drink. It's that simple. I very, very rarely get any feedback. So if you guys have got some feedback, there's a bit of an encouragement. You can hold, you hold me to it, yeah. So if you file a bug, you get a beer. Um, send me an email with good feedback, you get a beer. Um, tell me something I can do better. That's a beer, I'm, I'm not, hopefully I don't get hit with 20 beers. Um, but you know, it, it's fine, if that happens, I'll, I'll make do. So, so please give me feedback, because I'm always trying to improve. Um, any, any more questions at the end? I've got a yeoman problem, but. I'll follow up with that after this, all right. Thanks very much, guys. I really appreciate you giving your time to come along. Cheers.